You don't pop down to a shopping mall for anything that you need urgently. Nobody goes to Blue Water to buy bog roll. Malls are palaces of conspicuous consumption. Buying for the sheer giddy pleasure of it might seem rather vulgar, modern and, well, transatlantic. But retail therapy under one roof is something we British have been doing for nearly half a millennium. Want to go shopping? The City of London. 450 years ago, this was the birthplace of the shopping mall. Doesn't look much like the Arndale Centre, does it? Skewered at the top of the Royal Exchange is the logo of the man who founded it. Since Thomas Gresham's day, a lot has happened. It's burned down twice. For centuries, it also led a double life as a trading centre for Britain's financial sector. As recently as the 1980s, this place would have been full of men in red braces playing roulette with your pension and shouting, buy, sell, buy. That's sort of what it was built for. In the 1560s, Thomas Gresham decided that he wanted a comely bourse for merchants to assemble. So he built a kind of enclosed market like one he'd seen in Antwerp. But above these arcades, around the courtyards, were floors full of shops. Gresham's building was different to the kinds of shops or markets previously seen in Britain for two reasons. Number one, there was a roof to keep the rain off your roof and there were walls to protect you from all those ripe Elizabethan smells like horse excrement and human excrement. There were quite a lot of cows around here in those days too. And number two, it was a place where city boys could come to buy pretty stuff that they didn't really need. Stuff much like this though not exactly. So here in the 1560s, shopping underwent a subtle transformation. The pleasure of the act of buying, or even the pleasure of the possibility of the act of buying, could be just as important as what you took home with you in your string bag. So shopping now wasn't just a necessity, it could also be fun. For the first time, Britain had a class of wealthy professionals, people with powdered periwigs and fat wallets who said, let us go sport, sir, with Mrs Fitzsimmons. Their spending habits were as unrestrained as their hair pieces. Samuel Pepys went to exchanges regularly to buy stockings, lots of stockings. He really liked stockings, but not quite as much as he liked the women who sold them. He wasn't the only one. And in the end, that did for the exchanges. They developed a bit of a reputation, you see. If you'd have told any of your 17th century mates that you were going down the exchange to buy some stockings, they'd have given you a dirty great wink. One writer of the period compared them to a seraglio in which the women dressed themselves up for best advantage of sale, as well as the toys and fripperies they deal in. A seraglio, of course, is a sort of sultan's knocking shop. Eventually, that became a problem. People were just too worried about what exactly was being exchanged at the exchanges. In the 18th century, most closed down. But you can't squash a good idea just because a bunch of prostitutes and their johns have given it a bad name. In the early 19th century, covered shopping made a comeback, this time calling itself not an exchange, but an arcade. London's Burlington Arcade was one of the first. It opened in 1819. Once again, there was a roof to keep your wig dry. And now, the shopping units had glass fronts and doors. It's still the longest shopping arcade in Britain. And it has very distinctive bouncers. Mark, you're a bit better dressed than most security guards that I've met. Well, this is part of our traditional uniform as a beadle of the Burlington Arcade. So what does a beadle do? What is it, what's a beadle for? Originally, beadles were employed by landowners or indeed the church or factory owners to keep peace within a certain area and to make people um, obey the rules that were in place in that particular area because we predate the police forces in this country. The arcade still enforces its 19th century bylaws. 
You can't run or shout when the beetle's about. I mean, there are several rules that we still try to enforce in the arcade. We try not to let people hurry. We try not to let people whistle. Why is that? Well, originally, the pickpockets would have whistled signals to each other. And again, what happens if somebody does whistle? We politely ask them to stop. Um, originally, there would have been many, many more rules. Um, you weren't allowed, if you were a woman, you weren't allowed in the arcade unaccompanied. You weren't allowed to carry shopping in the arcade. It would have been brought to you at the end of the arcade okay. or delivered to your London residence. Right. In the early days of the arcade, the staff lived above the shop, often surrounded by their stock. Now, having a bed over the premises was a bit of a temptation for some of the female shopkeepers. It was the Royal Exchange all over again. Here was another place where 19th century men could come and buy some stockings. Although, here at the Burlington Arcade, it was a milliner's that had the most scandalous reputation. Millinery was just one thing on the shopping list of two particular Victorian ladies. They caused the juiciest scandal in the Burlington's history. In the 1870s, Fanny and Stella used to spend a lot of time here picking up blokes by fluttering their eyelashes and whistling at them. Their names were Ernest Bolton and Frederick William Park, two middle-class boys with a thing for corsetry and rouge and gentlemen with big sideys. Trolling up and down here was part of their daily routine until somebody noticed something fishy and reported them to a policeman. The trial of Fanny and Stella was a huge public sensation, but nobody could quite work out what law they'd broken, apart from the one against whistling. A former Burlington Arcade beadle gave evidence in court saying how he'd once chased Fanny and Stella out of a hosiery shop, but under cross-examination he was forced to admit that he'd also taken backhanders from female prostitutes to allow them to parade in the arcade. Maybe Bolton and Park just weren't good enough tippers. When the beadle recalled furiously that Stella had called him a sweet little deer, the court fell about laughing. The ladies were acquitted, though the huge crowds that turned up to see them were terribly disappointed that the boys didn't leave the courtroom in their frocks and corsets. Just as Bolton and Park were putting their civvies back on, a new wave of arcade building began. These Victorian shopping malls sprang up in seaside resorts and industrial cities, as well as the capital. Some Victorians liked the idea so much that they wanted to put entire cities under glass. One proposal would have linked Trafalgar Square with Bank on the other side of London through a great glass funnel. And Sir Joseph Paxton, the man who built the Crystal Palace, wanted to create a kind of Crystal M25, a great glass tube around the whole of central London. But as the 20th century arrived, arcades began to struggle to make ends meet. Department stores, with their electric elevators and their floor walkers, became the preferred model for covered shopping. So by the 1960s, Victorian relics like the Swan Arcade in Bradford were distinctly uneconomic. It was bought by two Yorkshiremen who had a dazzling vision for the future of retail. They flattened the arcade to make way for one of these. Their newfangled shopping centres took one syllable from each of their names, the start of Arnold Hagenbach and the end of Samuel Chippendale. Eighteen Arndales rose up around Britain from Manchester to Eastbourne. They copied the templates for mouths which had been developed in the United States. Most Arndales have long since been renamed and have all been remodelled or zhuzhed up. But there is one shopping centre where you can still get glimpses of the way they all were. The Elephant and Castle Centre in South London was one of the very first, opened the year after Kennedy was assassinated. It was once the largest in Europe. It's like moving forward in time, the publicity material said. Visiting now is more like going to an archaeological dig. 
Parts of this place feel like a kind of reliquary of 60s taste. But what you've got to remember is that in 1964, this was the future of shopping and walking around inside one of yesterday's tomorrows. Even then, though, it was just a case of back to the future. The 1960s centre was promising much the same advantages as the Royal Exchange had done 400 years earlier. Here, as there, you were protected from the traffic and jostling of the street and also kept dry and warm. Once you're in, you stay under cover all the time. Oil-fired central heating and air conditioning maintains a pleasant late spring atmosphere all year round. You may even have to remind yourself that it's winter shoes you're after. The developers gave us all this in the name of progress. They were bringing to the masses the glass and chrome sophistication of an international airport lounge. I think the housewife should be, wherever there is a covered centre, and I'm not just talking about Armdale now, wherever there's a covered centre, they should be grateful that they've got one. I think the housewife likes a little glamour in her life, don't you think? Do you think shopping should be fun? Yes, absolutely. Why should it be a chore? These men promised to stimulate British women till they melted the rubber wheels of their shopping trolleys. It was the planners who were the passion killers. America had built its mouths on the empty edges of towns. Britain, by contrast, raised large chunks of old city centres to make room for them. Then, giant traffic systems were coiled around them like a noose. Lugging bags through a subway while lorries roared overhead wasn't so glamorous for the 1960s housewife. As a result, some of the centres struggled to attract shoppers. This place was soon known as the White Elephant and Castle. Come 2010, it'll be a pile of rubble. But that doesn't mean that the concept has been consigned to the bargain basement of history. It just needs a few tweaks. Blue Water in Kent is Europe's biggest shopping mall. Maybe this is what Joseph Paxton dreamed of 150 years ago. A shopping arcade that's the size of a small city. Some of the architecture even looks a bit like his Crystal Palace, if you cross your eyes. 27 million customers loped through its sliding doors last year. That's ten times the number that went to Alton Towers. Shopping malls are now visitor attractions. Families come for a day out. Couples come on dates. They better be on their best behaviour, though. Just like the Burlington Arcade, this place has rules. You can whistle here. But you can't skateboard, and according to the official code of conduct, you can't slide down the banisters, and groups of five or more with no intention to shop can be ejected. And famously, hoodies are banned, banned, banned. Blue Water's anti-hoodie stance made the national news, delighted the Prime Minister, and led to an immediate surge in custom of 22%. From the days of the Burlington Arcade, these places have always tried to attract customers by promising to remove some of the more disagreeable aspects of shopping in the street. Not just the rain, but the riffraff. That's why you won't find supermarkets or DIY stores in some of the modern malls. Bullcocks and Brillo pads are just too common for them. The trick of the modern shopping mall is to make you feel that you're dead classy, that you're going up in the world. Look, art! OK, so it's a lot of ghastly kitsch, but you don't get that on the yoghurt aisle in Tesco. And when was the last time you saw a nude acrobat flying over your high street? These are the altarpieces in a cathedral of consumerism. This is its cupola. Surely we must be in shopping heaven. I suppose that for some people, the very idea of shopping for fun is a contradiction in terms. But if this place is your idea of hell, then you're very much in the minority. It's just like the old Burlington Arcade, really, only it's been democratised. That one small, narrow shopping street has been expanded into an entire city. One thing's different, though. There's no hanky-panky with the staff, no matter how many points you have on your reward card.